first break will be uh, coming up soon. The story of the inside story. I like to make Channel 6 crazy. He's the second most powerful person in the city of Philadelphia, or at least we think he is. He's the president of city council. What he says makes a lot of news. His impact on the city, enormous. Tonight, a conversation with the president of Philadelphia City Council. Although he has a uh, great personality, a lot of people really don't know a lot about him. Daryl Clark, graduate of Philadelphia schools, former uh, top aide to John Street, uh, city council member, elected city council president, recently rocked the city as far as I'm concerned by suggesting that uh, we need to take a look at the city of Baltimore and its cameras, its crime fighting cameras. He's a man who is, uh, uh, in my view, stirring up the pot in many ways and we haven't really had a chance to sit down with him until now. It's great to see with you. My pleasure. Thank and you Great so to much. see you. He was actually a companion at the uh, Democratic Convention. We sat mm -hmm. and watched the uh, events together there. Let's talk about Baltimore and its police cameras. What fascinated you about that? Well, the thing that fascinated me about Baltimore is we had actually gone to Baltimore years ago prior to us initiating cameras here in the city of Philadelphia because we heard about what they were doing down there. We took a contingent twice first time with the police commissioner, second time with the then mayor, John Street, uh, Councilman Rizzo and Councilwoman Miller at the time. And we brought into that initiative. Um, we started early on in the process. We had several bumps. These are not just red light cameras. These, no, are, these are protective cameras. They call them security cameras. Right. And they have now morphed into a significant, and I mean significant strategy as it relates to implementing cameras. Uh, one of the most important things that I saw was the intelligence associated with the placement of cameras. No city will, other than maybe London will ever have enough cameras to place them on every street corner. So what they've done, they've done their intelligence on patterns uh, similar to what they do in gun stat. They've actually looked at crime stat as it relates to commercial car to crimes, neighborhood crimes, and they not only deploy the cameras, but they actually have a system where the monitors are targeting those particular areas to ensure in a very proactive way that they can deal with any particular crime initiative. Now, right now, does Philadelphia have as many cameras as Baltimore? Well, I'm sad to say that right now the city of Philadelphia has approximately 200 cameras, uh, and there's some question as to how many are operable. Baltimore right now has approximately 700 cameras in a city that's less than half our size. So there's about uh, 700,000 people in Baltimore, something like that, 600,000? 660, yeah. Okay, so, so it's the amount of cameras, but not just the amount of cameras, but where they're placed. Exactly. That's the key. Exactly. And, and how the individuals are targeted in terms of time and in terms of how they're able to actually look at real time. Uh, we actually during the course of our visit we were watching one of the monitors and a former police officer which are the people that actually monitored their cameras they work for a private company they actually this lady actually saw two individuals one of whom she actually arrested several times so she obviously targeted this person and she <coughs> predicted that this person was going to sell drugs and sure enough as she's watching the camera the guy reaches in his pocket he looks around as if no one's looking he gives the other guy a package she immediately picks up the microphone calls the police and says these two individuals gave the description and the police were deployed to deal with that situation right there in real time. Okay, so how can we, first of all, use our cameras better in Philadelphia or the sub suburbs for that matter? I know a lot of, the, I know a lot of uh, shopping centers have cameras like that to track right. people on the way out. Uh, can we afford it? Is it very expensive? And how can we use the, the ones that we have better? 
Well, we've actually spent upwards of $13 million on our current camera system. The question as to whether or not all the cameras uh, have been placed is still in question. We're trying to get more information. But I think the most important thing is our ability to utilize cameras that the city of Philadelphia does not own. We had a hearing recently within the last week, and we found out that SEPTA has 12,000 cameras. Uh, the Philadelphia Housing Authority has thousands of cameras. The school district has cameras. So there are already cameras that are owned by some, some segment of government. And then, as you know, a lot of commercial carters have cameras. Uh, every time there's a commission of the crime, the first thing the police do is run out and say, do you have a camera? Can we pull off the tape? So what I'm saying is the first thing we need to do is integrate all the cameras, both pri private and public, and form a private-public partnership, which was what happened in Baltimore. Johns Hopkins, which is a immense university and hospital, they actually formed a partnership not only with the police but the commercial carters surrounding that particular university and the local community development corporation and they bought cameras that had the same spec specifications and they were able to integrate those cameras and they ultimately all fed back to the police system, to the police department so they can be real time, um, be in a position to be extremely proactive in preventing crime. So I think here we're poised having University of Penn, Temple University, Temple, Temple Drexel, all those universities all have significant camera systems. I like to say that uh, I kind of envy university's camera system because they've dropped crime like 40% in that particular targeted area. Integrate our systems with those systems, uh, have an operating capacity that allows the police to tie into that in a meaningful way, and where we don't have fiber to put our own cameras, see if we can build out from this, the SEPTA, the police department, uh, building out from um, the universities and the hospitals, which we talked about at the hearing, and they said they did, in fact, have that capacity. So the opportunity is there. We just have to have the willingness to do it. You know, it brings back an interesting point that a lot of people don't think about here. I've been, I've been sort of talking about this in different ways for years. Regional cooperation, okay? I, I, never, I don't remember the exact count, but at one point we counted up the number of police departments working in and around Philadelphia, whether it be federal, uh, hospital police departments, uh, university police departments, uh, the DP, DRP, uh, Del River Port Authority, uh, school district of Philadelphia, uh, uh, security for the court systems. We got a lot of protection out right, there, right. and and ha and how much coordination is there? The concept of SEPTA having so many thousands of, of cameras, and Temple University and Penn and all the other schools that are located in the city. How hard would it be? It's going to take some leadership to get this done, isn't it? I mean, it would be great to have all these cameras operating in, in one network. Yeah, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. Um, I think that we'll get some significant feedback from the administration. Uh, we're going to keep pushing the issue, and we're going to provide information to show in other instances like Baltimore and Chicago and some other locations that have a very aggressive system that we should be able to enact some of the the strategies associated with how they do that here in the city of Philadelphia. I think we're poised to do it. Uh, we can have it done in a way that's productive, proactive, and we need to get moving on this. And I, we had the police, we've had the police commissioner on several times in the program, and we were talking about crime in the city. It appears uh, that the crime is, uh, violent crime is on the increase, but he said that the biggest crime issue was crimes against property, mm -hmm. property crime that impacts on people. But nevertheless, a crime situation, whether it's big or small, and that's publicized as most crimes should be when they are, when they do happen, creates an imagery that the city may be, number one, more unsafe than it really is, mm -hmm. or less safe. I mean, you know, it, 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 this is an issue, isn't it? Absolutely. No, it's all about the perception. If people perceive the city to be a place that's not safe, they're not going to make that decision to move here, to locate their business here. Uh, we've done a lot better in terms of uh, sending the signal that we're open for business and we have a safe environment. But at the end of the day, when our stats come out, the stats say other things. So uh, while our commissioner and, and the mayor have done a good job on promoting safety, uh, I think that there are other strategies that we need to adopt to enhance our ability to make sure that our citizens are safe. Okay, if, if the council president has his way, you may be seeing a sign on a city building that says, watch Voice of Reason Sunday night on the Comcast network. Right. Uh, you, you've talked now in city council about the amount of dollars that the city of Philadelphia could gain by allowing advertising on some of its structures. Uh, you, you like the idea? You think it's going to fly? Uh, I hope so. Uh, we actually initiated a series of revenue measures 
about a year and a half ago before I was a council president. And one of the ones that I like the most is the ability to advertise on municipally owned property. Um, we've seen across the country, and we've actually done an analysis of different municipalities, uh, such as New York, as an example. New York has a $100 million concessions contract uh, with a vendor that allows them to get that revenue based on advertisement and other types of uh, instruments being placed on municipally owned properties. What we're saying is that we should craft a strategy that in a tasteful way, because we'd like to have a structure that we can determine the content. We probably don't want to advertise liquor or cigarettes or some of the other things that people don't think is appropriate. Or soft drinks. Or maybe, soft drinks, maybe, unless maybe, it's a maybe, diet. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Uh, but by virtue of us owning the real estate, uh, be it a uh, building, be it a recreation center, we can determine the content and we can also determine the location. Currently in the city of Philadelphia, all of the advertisements, with the exception of SEPTA, and I like to talk about that briefly, is being done on privately owned property. So we can't really dictate the content. So you'll ride down the street or 95 or wherever and you'll see billboards advertising everything, sometimes with scantily clad women. And at the you end don't of the want day, that on city property. I wouldn't want that on city no. property. But the reality is there are a lot of products uh, that we think make some sense and we can get significant revenue. SEPTA right now is bringing in millions and millions of dollars utilizing perfect advertisement. You see a bus going down the street, the likelihood that there's going to be some sort of a advertisement wrapped around that bus. Uh, in the train station, uh, recently went to uh, Amtrak station, 30th Street station. They had a sign, it was, must have been 40, 50 feet tall, advertising Tropicana. That's revenue being generated. We need to get in that game. Um, I, I, like th I think it's very innovative to think about that. Absolutely. Now, there's, an, there's another issue here. Why, you know, why not take uh, the recreation centers, and we've always had, even during tough times, the, one of the largest recreation departments in the country. Why not take recreation centers and allow them for the right amount of money to be sponsored by uh, uh, athletic shoe companies or, uh, uh, you know, uh, athletic commercial athletic drinks right. or things like that? Right. What would you think about that? Uh, Larry, that's actually one of the proposals that we talk about. Uh, as we were in Baltimore looking at cameras, we rode by a public, publicly owned field. It was actually one of the school district's fields down there, and it was sponsored by Under Armour. And the story, as we were riding on the bus, told us that the Under Armour company came in and renovated the entire field, put a brand new scoreboard, and the only thing they wanted to do was have under Armour across the scoreboard. I'm saying, why oh, are we gotta, not doing that? You got to take that. that do you need approval of city council for that or what? We, act, we need approval by city council if it's a long-term contract. But the, the, in that case, the school district would have to authorize that. And given the challenges associated with the fiscal condition of the school district, I would be willing to think that they would be more than interested in entering into some sort but of But the agreement. recreation department is a no-brainer on oh, that. Oh, look. I I'm mean, not. you can go to baseball companies or glove companies or, you Nike. know. Put a Nike, Nike sign yeah. on the rest. I think that's. I think you guys ought to move on that right away. That's um, just, you know, that's that's tasteful and it's uh, and it's also a very valuable thing for uh, the advertisers. I'm with you. Larry. Now, uh, shutting down public schools, mm -hmm. you have uh, limited options on that because you have a school reform commission here. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about the buildings they've selected and where the kids are going? I'm extremely concerned. Uh, we have actually uh, early on in the process talked about a moratorium. And some people said a year. I don't know what the time frame should be. Uh, the school district's mistake was they essentially went out, they made a determination without talking to anybody, without talking to the elected officials, without talking to the community, without talking to all of the other stakeholders, be it SEPTA for, as it relates to transportation, its funders. And what they're doing now is appropriate. They're actually going out to the individual schools. I've been to a couple of the meetings in my district, and they're talking to residents. And the residents are actually coming up with some pretty good alternative ideas. Uh, I, I want to give Dr. Height credit. Uh, he came in. He understood that there was a challenge. He talked to the residents. He said, submit an alternative plan. And we're currently in the process of doing that. And I have to believe that at the end of the day, there will probably be some changes. But at the end of the day, the closures were based on capacity of schools and current uh, numbers within the school of children. Um, and that's fine. I understand numbers are what they are. Fiscal situation is very challenging. But at the end of the day, wherever we move these kids, you have to have a first class education. And I have to resolve the school closure issue. I like to see us focus directly on ensuring that wherever these children are, they get a great education. President of City Council uh, Daryl Clark in Philadelphia will be back in a moment with 
Some really dramatic news. You may, you may not believe this, but the members of city council are going on stage. And this could be an epic moment in the history of Philadelphia City Council. We're talking entertainment here when we return. Okay, we have breaking news of sorts. They'll either break your heart or really entertain you. The sizzling 17, or will it be city council busts? We'll see. Here's the story. On Thursday, this coming Thursday, February 21st, 6 to 9 p.m., Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. You saw it. You see the picture. The city council talent show. You can purchase tickets online at philabundance.org slash city council. Philabundance, great organization that's feeding the people who need to be fed, and uh, just requires a contribution, any contribution you want to make, to see Daryl Clark and the Sizzling 17. Now, wh what are you going to do? Have you decided yet? Can yeah, we're going to do a contemporary R&B song. Uh, we're uh, setting up our practice for early next week. We don't want to over-practice, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we hope that we can maintain some level of tune. Uh, you going to take this to The Voice next or uh, American Idol or what? Uh, I kind of think we probably would qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. It's, it's going to be a fun event. Though. Well, it's called yeah. good luck, and I yeah. think it's great that all of you are doing it. I can't wait to see some of the council members in their costumes or whatever they're going to do. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about the property taxes. What is AVI, and what, what should we know about it? Yeah. Well, AVI is an actual value initiative. It essentially, uh, over the years, we've had fluctuating 
values and rates. Uh, we used to have this formula that essentially had a multiplier and you divide, and then the day was very confusing. And to a large degree, it, it, it created a tax system that wasn't fair. You could have properties on the same block, comparable buildings, uh, taxes way out of line, one with the other. So the hope is that by valuing the property by what it is based on recent sales, the market, and the condition, that person will get a value. Then we will have to apply a rate, and that rate will determine what your tax bill will be. Um, we found out, as most people anticipated, that the value of the city of Philadelphia's taxes and property has gone up pretty high. But what we want to do is ensure, in spite of that, that it's done in a fair and equitable way, but in addition to which, where people truly aren't in a position to pay the increased taxes, some cases the taxes have gone up in neighborhoods through no fault of their own. And you don't want them to move out because I, of that, exactly. right? Exactly. That's the last thing we need to do is create an environment in the city of Philadelphia where the tax system is, is such that it prohibits individuals from even considering moving into the city of Philadelphia. One thing. I think that's Philadelphia's real advantage versus the suburban and Jersey uh, counties that our tax, real estate taxes are much lower than those surrounding counties. So we have to maintain that to a degree. But we want to make sure that people pay based on what their value is. And for those who truly don't have the ability to pay, we create methods and mechanisms to ensure that we can provide some support for those individuals. Give me a read on city council. I mean, I've been covering city councils for uh, on and off for 46 years here. And sub councils have been uh, kind of dormant. Mm -hmm. Others have been active with a lot of debate. Some of the ideas you've talked about today that are not only yours, but other people's ideas are new and innovative. Uh, is this a council of action or is this a council that's going to uh, lay back and let the mayor do everything? I think that this is probably, uh, in my political history, probably the most aggressive proactive council that I can think of um, as a whole. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have six new members, uh, comes from different walks of life, some political, some civic, a um, couple of lawyers. At the end of the day, they've come to the table with some very aggressive ideas. Um, in all honesty, every now and then some of them don't make much sense, but I like the fact that they're putting things on the table and they understand that they want to be a contributing factor as it relates to improving our city. Uh, we have a good mix of new, we have some relatively recent fresh persons, the three of them, and then we have the old heads like myself and other members. Yes, who since 1999. That's some, one of the uh, oldest, right? Exactly. So we could bring a little wisdom to the table, but I think that combination has created a very good environment. Uh, we all like each other. Uh, we all talk about issues. Uh, I'm trying to be as open as possible as it relates to the process. Uh, making sure that whatever assistance I can provide to those members in terms of resources we put on the table. So I'm very proud of the City Council of City. Of what about uh, in every administration? <clears throat> John Street had his issues with council. Uh, Ed Rendell had his issues with council, although I think they weren't as bad as Street. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, Michael Nutter has had a pretty good run now. He's in his, I guess, sixth year of, of office. Mm -hmm and uh, he's done some good things and people seem to like him around the area. Mm -hmm. uh, controversial, all mayors are. Mm -hmm. But uh, does he have a, a better relation with council now than he did, let's say, uh, two or three years ago? I think it depends on the issue. Um, when there's an issue that some people are adamant about, and it may happen on the AVI initiative, um, the relationships are what they are. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, as you know, the mayor wanted to move forward on AVI. Uh, we didn't believe we were ready because we had no numbers and I didn't think it would have been irresponsible, frankly speaking, to enact legislation without having numbers. Uh, we now are getting the numbers and I think it's time to move ahead. Um, but genuinely, on a, we do disagree on issues. I mean, I disagree with a number of issues on the mayor, but it's a way you disagree. Uh, the public, as witness in the uh, federal level, they want people to get together. They want people to work together and solve problems. Um, we may have our disagreements, but we don't need it to spill out in the public so people think we're a dysfunctional group. Uh, at the end of the day, wherever we can get a consensus, I think we need to move ahead on that consensus. And where we don't have a consensus, let's talk about a way that we can get to where we need to get. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about the citizens of the city of Philadelphia. And we need to be productive. A couple of days ago, before the taping, before the actual broadcast of this show, uh, the decision came down that you may not know about. The Attorney General of Pennsylvania uh, struck down in her own way 
the contract that uh, Governor Corbett wanted to sign with an, a, an overseas na a co company from England, which was actually owned by a Canadian teachers union, mm -hmm. to uh, privatize the Pennsylvania lottery. Mm. Uh, her point was that uh, she he had usurped the power of the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in Philadelphia and you were looking at uh, selling advertising, mm -hmm. uh, the, some of the uh, concepts you took today, uh, how much power does a council have in really pushing that through? And can the mayor approve that without your, your, without your blessing? Well, the mayor can only approve it if it's a multi-year, I'm sorry, if a single one-year contract. Uh, the reality is that any advertiser would want to have multi-year contracts and that would have to go to the City Council of Philadelphia. Um, similarly, we can't enact a program that allows advertisement on publicly owned properties unless the mayor, one, put out a request for proposals and enter into a contract with the vendor. Uh, we're hoping, and we've started that process, that we come together, enter into an agreement, to have a long-term strategy that will raise millions of dollars. I feel real confident about saying that. So. It's all about checks and balances. Uh, there are some things we can do um, without the mayor, some we can't. There's some things he can do without us, the mayor, some he can't. That's why it's important for us to work together on very important initiatives as it relates to enhancing the city of Philadelphia. Now, you're not involved in the lottery, but privatization. Do you, do you see any areas of city government where privatization would work? You know, privatization sounds good but it's a two-way street. It doesn't always work right. and has, hasn't always worked in all American cities. How do you feel about that? Well, you know, generally I've seen privatization ultimately end up being lower wages for workers. Yeah. And I'm very concerned about the conversation around privatization of liquor control board, privatization of the lottery, uh, particularly in the case of the lottery where it's a system that works. And, you know, for whatever reason, there's this wish to move ahead and privatize that. I don't have jurisdiction over that, will not have a vote, um, but if someone were to ask me, I wouldn't be supportive of that. Uh, as it relates to liquor stores, um, at this point, the Liquor Control Board has some pretty good jobs associated with those. Uh, I'm concerned that if it becomes private, one, the wages will go down, the benefits will diminish, and at the end of the day, I'm not really sure there'll be much better service. If this whole issue around providing um, a product that's diversified, in terms of having it in the, the state controlled store, then we need to work on that. But I, at this point, I really don't support a privatization of the LCB. Another interesting issue about LCB is that uh, they find that in states that do have a state system, there's only a few, mm. that they have less drunk driving accidents. How about that? Well, that's interesting. So, you know, it's just that's something to think about. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, let's talk about politics. Uh, we're a year and a half away from a mayoral election in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have aspirations to uh, run for mayor? Uh, right now, I'm clearly focused on being the best city council president I can be. Uh, I found that whenever you start talking about your next job, you diminish the existing job that you have. So I don't want to entertain conversations with anybody about my next job because I'm quite happy where I am and I'm trying to be as productive as I can as a council president. You didn't say president. no. Well, I've learned. That. <laughs> well, you know, that's a loaded question. Yeah, of course. No, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I, I think we have significant work at hand. Uh, we have to move to this AVA pro AVI process. We're going to have another challenging budget. When I start thinking about running for mayor or running for senator or congress, then I'm taken away from my job at hand. So I'm, I'm, I'm focused on this job that I have currently. Okay, so we, we are, we're standing by. We're five days away, Thursday, four days away from this t talent show at the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, you will see, if you go to this show, the city council president in some different outfit than he's wearing now, probably a little more informal and groovy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And uh, anybody that, can you give away any of the other acts? Well, <laughs> there, I know one of the skits is going to be a take on a Saturday Night Live. Um, I know that there's going to be one of the acts that's going Who's to focus. Who's the comedian? Do you have a comedian on council? I believe that Councilman Bill Greenlee is going to give some very, very funny stories uh, to tell. He's actually a very funny guy. Okay, well. don't forget you can show up at the door February 21st at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Daryl Clark, President of Philadelphia City Council. Thanks for joining us in a Thank very you. candid conversation. Thank you. Thank you.